Um, I'm going to switch here. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you all for getting here for a, a seminar. Uh, the seminar is uh, called uh, Struct uh, Structural State Violence, uh, the case of Norway, in short. Uh, my name is Michael Specialski. I'm from the Pantry Foundation, which is the organizer of this event. We are the Polish NGO uh, that is working uh, f uh, for ma many years now in transborder issues, mostly family issues regarding Polish, but also um, we are um, party of um, uh, in some procedures in asylum seekers here in Poland. Um, for, instance, for instance, one is Norwegian. And uh, our guest uh, is uh, a councillor, uh, Mr. Marius Rikeros, uh, uh, a councillor uh, in the European Court of Human Rights. And he has a long rank of, of experience in uh, helping uh, Norwegians, but also um, other um, nationalities in Norway uh, with the system of Barneverne, so the system of uh, the um, uh, child welfare system. And uh, he's going to uh, speak more about uh, how it's working and how, uh, how this, this, the theme of this our topic, the structural violence in practice uh, of Norway, uh, is, is, is in, in, it's in act. And uh, how, why Norway is not uh, fulfilling uh, the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights. So uh, I'm not going to uh, waste man more time. And uh, the floor is yours, Marius. Could you give you an uh, introduction? Uh, to everybody to, uh, about the system, about how it's working, mm -hmm. about the international context. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. It's, uh, first of all, wonderful to be here in Poland again after the pandemic, uh, at least to be able to travel again. Uh, I'm, a, <coughs> as you said, a human rights counselor. I have been uh, working with human rights issues since I graduated from law school 20, actually more than 20 years ago, time flies. Um, and this particular topic has a um, big interest for me. And um, as most people uh, think of Norway and the Scandinavian countries are pretty solid when it comes to the rule of law, which might be true, I don't know. Uh, but the sad fact is, of course, that since September 2018, in, in uh, three years from now, uh, Norway has been convicted 12 times in the European Court of Human Rights for violating Article 8, which is a record high number. If you take that, if you see on the, ch on, on the specific child welfare cases, we have like more convictions in the European Court of Human Rights since sub September 2018 than the, co the other European countries combined, which is, in my opinion, very sensational. If you see, like you said, you were dealing with Denmark and Sweden and uh, Finland, uh, they have zero convictions in the same period. So we have uh, very sad statistics, and I think we will even have more uh, judgments coming now on November 25th, next Thursday, uh, where, I, where I have been signalized that there will be even further convictions on our rules. That remains to be seen, but anyhow, the number is record high. And that proves that Norway, if, since we're talking about the child welfare system in Norway, we have obvious problem with this system, especially regarding to foreign citizens living in Norway. In, um, we had a grand chamber, I was a counsel in the grand chamber judgment in this Lubin versus Norway that was uh, released by the court on uh, 10 September 2019. A few months later, a Polish woman won in the European Court against Norway, in this case called AS versus Norway, um, which of course was a tremendous victory for her, uh, and she was also supported by the Polish government, which is defeated in that case. Uh, however, the problem is that what, even though when the court is making their judgment saying that Norway is deliberately violating Article 8 of the Convention, they are doing nothing or the government is doing nothing to rectify the violation, meaning that they're doing nothing to reunite the, the, the child and the um, biological parents or the biological family. And that applies to this case uh, with the Polish woman as well. And um, so even after the Grand Chamber judgment in, uh, in September 2019, uh, and even after 10 judgments after that Grand Chamber judgments, neither of these families have been able to be reunited with their, with their, with their children. So that proves to me that Norway is uh, ignoring the fundamental, not only that they're violating the human rights, but they're not doing anything to comply with, uh, with Article 46 of the Convention saying that um, 
proving that how to put the ad to put the victims in a position that the violations did not occur or had not occurred. So um, we are absolutely facing huge problems. And since this um, since this seminar is about how to combat violations uh, or uh, violence on, on women and girls in particular, um, I feel that when, when Norway is disregarding these judgments that are so clear, um, it's obvious that the parents who have been victimized do feel that the Norwegian government is violating them or committing violence against them, because violence comes in a lot of terms. So my main job with regard to these cases is not only to, to bring them to the European Court of Human Rights, but also to make the international society aware that uh, Norway has severe problems respecting these judgments. And, um, and that's actually my main focus coming here to Warsaw, to, to try to raise more awareness, at least to the Polish society with regard to this AS versus Norway case that I urge Poland, as well as other countries, to put even more pressure on Norway to help these victims to, to have justice to be done. Because otherwise, what's happening now is that even though the court has addressed violation in these cases, uh, we see that uh, the violations are going on because they're doing nothing to, to repair these violations, except paying some money. But that's like a symbolic amount anyway for a rich country like Norway, so it has no meaning for the government. So. So I think that the situation in my country is pretty severe and um, obviously as long as Norway is, uh, as long as the international society is not aware of these uh, huge problems in my own country, it's, um, I think that the violations will continue. So that's basically the, the format of this uh, event as well. And uh, yeah, of course we would um, have questions about that, but um, the, the, it's it's very obvious that uh, we need some kind of international support. Okay, uh, so Marius, you're saying that Norway is paying out the, the, the judgments because each judgment is like uh, 35,000 euro or something plus minus. Yeah, the standard uh, amount is 25,000 euro. 25,000 euro, so they're paying. Yeah, yeah. So this is fulfilling the judgments. But uh, you're saying that there, the, there's Article 36 that it's, uh, shows that uh, they should ch change the situation, the factual situation that, that uh, the violation was um, uh, done. So uh, my question is, <coughs> after those the judgments in the European Court of Human Rights, mm -hmm. uh, do the uh, Norwegian courts open those cases? Uh, that was, you know, the, the, those decision uh, Okay, um, in the court cases that uh, mm -hmm. made those children, um, you know, taken from the family and mm -hmm. and and uh, give to the communas, to the to the to the municipality, uh, or and then f f f further to the foster families, do they open those cases? Well, first of all, you have to realize that in order to we have a system in Norway that when a violation has been found by the court, you are entitled to go to the domestic courts or the Norwegian courts to reopen the case or to reopen the proceedings. Uh, however, there is, you have to realize that asking for reopening a process is basically meaning that uh, the court has found a procedural error on, on the domestic judgments. But in the cases where Norway has been convicted in these child welfare cases, uh, the court has found material errors, meaning that they have already ruled in these cases. So that means that when, for instance, in this AS versus Norway, the Polish case, uh, the court ruled that Norway violated Article 8 of the Convention in the sense of the material aspects of the case, the material, the, the, the material merits. And that means that it's not necessary for the Norwegian domestic courts to reopen the case because the case has already been dealt with by the by, by a higher court, by the by the European Court of Human Rights, which has a, of course, is the highest ranking in Europe when it comes to human rights law. Um, so, the, do they dismiss <coughs> the cases? Do, do they dismiss? So, in these two cases where I've been involved uh, with regard to reopening the case, the Lobben versus uh, Norway, the, the, that was a grand chamber judgment, as well as the AS versus Norway. Uh, the courts have simply denied to deal with the cases by, by saying that it will not alter the cases anyway. Because, and the reason why they say that is because the children who have been taken into public care 
have been so long with the foster parents that it's not possible, in their opinion, to reunite the parents with uh, the biological parents with, uh, with the children. So they simply refuse, even though the court, the European Court, has stated that um, these violations are, are, are material. So they, they simply refuse because they say it's nothing we can do about it because time has passed and it's, it's impossible to reunite the, the, the children with the families because they've already been so attached to the foster parents. But do they, do they, uh, do they <coughs> make them, uh, kind of make experts who say that uh, they are attached or it's like authoritative uh, saying by the court? It's a single judge saying that it's impossible. So, so the, there is so no... There is no scientific basis upon. So the court is not opening, and and uh, with the procedures are checking what is the bind, uh, bind, uh, bind be be between the new parent and no. the biological. No. So they they only say, uh, for instance, the the we, there was a reopening process in the Lovin case in in uh, a few months ago back in Norway, where this where the the court was sitting with a single judge saying that a city court judge saying that. Even though uh, Lobin won in the Grand Chamber, there is nothing the court can do in order to reunite the, 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 the child and the family since the child has been in foster home for so many years. So mm -hmm. basically what she's saying is, and the judge also said that 25,000 euro should be a decent compensation for the violation found by the court. So, so, the, so, so she, the judge, which is also the, and that's quite interesting as well. For in, in since I know Poland has a conflict with the, uh, or, or Norway is mucking on the Norway, on the Polish judiciary. The the judge who is the chair of the Norwegian Judge Association, she said that uh, twenty. She she obviously said that twenty five thousand euro is the price for a violation in this sense. So that that really for losing a child. Losing a child, yeah. So that was her basic opinion stated in the judgment, saying that twenty five thousand euro should be a decent compensation for losing or for for the state to kidnap her child because these are actually state kidnappings, and I think these are the worst violence you can ever imagine for a mother to be exposed for or a father for that sake. But but for these, and I've seen so many of these families since I've been involved in a lot of these cases, uh, where where the um, where where the parents um, don't stand that any longer and commit suicide, for instance. So it's um, it's a deep tragedy in Norway these cases. C c can we go back uh, some s <coughs> um, uh, how the procedure is because maybe not not many know how the procedure of taking the child is is managed because it's it's not a uh, first of all it's not a court procedure like in Poland for instance no. it's an administrative procedure mm -hmm. and you can appeal to the court to dismiss this to dismiss this. Uh, administrative procedure. So the state is taking by the administrative procedure the child. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's um, um, then the mother or father don't have a, like a real contact with the child. Like I don't know uh, the case that we are running is like the, she can meet once a year for six hours or something like this when the pro when the, the child is taken. And the procedures, uh, she's of course suing this administrative procedure to the to the regional court, to the first level court, then to the appeal court. Uh, so could you say a bit about how, how it's how it's running on the on the on the before? <coughs> yeah, I think the Norwegian. Since I've been traveling to a lot of countries discussing these topics, I think the Norwegian uh, system is contrary to most countries in the civilized world, because we have a system that allows the child welfare system or the administrative part to interfere in the family life and even take the child out of um, out from his biological family without any court proceedings which is in my opinion uh, outrageous with you when you see it compared to the rule of law um, so and and that means that when the child has been taken out or from the biological family based on a based on a sort of like an administrative uh, proceeding uh, or a decision, uh, the families have to fight in the system in a case where the child has already been taken. And when we have a, in Norway, uh, we have a very, court, the court system in Norway, in my opinion, is very loyal to the government or to the public officials. So the statistics prove that once the child has been taken out of the family, um, 
roughly 90% of the cases are won by the government. So it's only in 10% of the cases that there is a slight chance for the families to uh, to get the child back as after the child has been taken into public so, care. So first of all, uh, the this procedure. Um, it's it's hard for the for for, for the <coughs> parents to uh, have uh, the biological, biological parents to have contact with the child that is taken. Yeah. Then there's the, the judgment. Some uh, of course the um, there can be um, a case in European Court of Human Rights for some some years, mm -hmm. and uh, and this is and then the courts are saying that uh, s uh, so many time have passed and the child is uh, couldn't be returned to the biological mother. Yeah, it's like a it's a thumb finger rule that. As long as the child has been taken into public care for more than three years, it's basically impossible to to be reunited with the child before the child is uh, 18 and mature. So that's uh, that's like a thumb finger rule. So by by the Norwegian court system. So th uh, do you think this is kind of a, a secondary violation, like a uh, after this, like you know we have the judgment, but the uh, the other judgments. Uh, of the of the of the Norwegian courts that saying that we uh, can't they, it's a material um, uh, violations. violations but uh, we can't return because factual the child is attached more to, to the <coughs> family is this a, kind of a new violation like a obviously it is because what what the court has ruled upon for instance in AS versus Norway the Polish case is that uh, by not reuniting that that's the ironic part if you read that judgment. The court is very clear by, by not reuniting the mother and the child, uh, that constitutes a violation. And when, when the government continues to run by that principle, not reuniting the child and the, and the mother, uh, they have obviously continued to violate Article 8 even after the conviction. So that's what's happening. So in all of these 12 cases where Norway has been found guilty by the European Court of Human Rights, they say the same thing. that. Uh, that taking a child into public care is a temporary measure, uh, where that temporary measure should be discontinued as soon as circumstances permit. Meaning that the court acknowledged that in some cases, of course, there can be valid reason for the government to interfere in the family life. But if they do so, and if that interference is valid, they have the obligation to, to end or to cease these interference as soon as circumstances permit. Meaning, and that's the problem with Norway, that they never end these interferences. They continue and continue and continue until these children are 18. And uh, so, so most of these parents, they don't have any chance at all. And, and, and the interesting part with regard to Poland again, we had this case, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this consul who was helping a lot of Polish families in Norway, because we have a big Polish community in Norway. And, and in my opinion, he did a tremendously good job by fighting for, for these families. But what happens with these people who are trying to, to give solid legal assistance to these families is that they're being some kind of like persecuted. In his case, he was sort of like a person on Grata in Norway because he was actually doing his job. So it's... Um, it's and no, 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 uh, <coughs> drum and police violate his, uh, uh, his autonomy as a counselor. Yeah, was uh, uh, not the Roman police. It was also called the Hamar police. Oh, Hamar police. Okay. Uh, but uh, obviously, they um, they ignore his uh, consular his rights, his immunity, and, so and that uh, proves not only to him that uh, if he was like a sole example, it could have been it could have been easier debated. But this is like a pattern here that the the people who were trying to fight for justice are being mocked or kicked in, kicked out for some reasons and. And that makes it even more difficult for these families to, to fight. So, um, so I think that the situation is, um, is rather drastical. I'm very happy that we're being, it's being more and more focused on it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going actually to Colombia in three weeks from now and even to discuss there the issue because there are a lot of even families uh, from um, Latin American and South American countries who are also facing these problems in Norway. So this is not only a problem and the interesting part is that in that grand chamber judgment, the, the, the 13 judges who convicted Norway said that this is not only a matter of um, cases between the individual or the families and the, and the Norwegian state, but it's also a matter of states versus Norway. So we have seen a lot of states who have, uh, and even the European Parliament have, uh, 
made resolutions against this. We had the European Council making a resolution a few years ago about this, and you even had a this resolution was drafted in the, the Council of Europe three years ago, back in June 2018. And this case raised awareness all over the world. Uh, there were protests in 2016 in more than 30 countries, included here in Poland. Um, so they were able to raise awareness, but we saw the same thing that people who were standing in the front line in that case as well were being like repressed or retaliated by the system. Uh, like, um, I was this Norwegian teacher who got involved in this case in his small community and he got fired from his job because he, he uh, expressed his opinion about this case in the media. So he got fired. So it, it proves again that uh, it's, uh, it's not a very democratic system where as long as, you be, as, long as you're in conflict with the, with the system you may be you may be reprinted or retaliated by the by the uh, by the government and the, and the families because you said that uh, some some Norwegians some uh, some uh, um, people that are living in Norway are fleeing from Norway because they are afraid about the system the disclosed system and they can't fight uh, legally uh, uh, to secure their freedoms so uh, do they have repressions because uh, do they have like the, the police do they uh, make uh, have some uh, criminal cases uh, for uh, abducting their own child, yeah, or a lot of cases, a lot of them are. are and and what if they go back? Uh, do they got sentence? They got sentence. Most of them. How do. much? Well, it depends. Um, six months is like a maybe a thumping rule for for a lot of these parents who have adopted their own children to uh, to other countries. Um, so um, I, I remember very well when. Um, Mrs. Trudeloben won in the Grand Chamber, which was an historical day because it, uh, that was the first time Norway was convicted in the Grand Chamber in the child welfare case. And of course, she was uh, happy, to, she was uh, hoping then she could finally be reunited with her son. So, she, two weeks after the judgment was released, um, her son was 11 years old, and she stepped up on her school by giving him a birthday card saying that happy birthday my son and congratulations with the victory in the European Court because he also won in the European Court, not only the mother but also the, the son. And um, the principal at the school called the police when, uh, when she came to the school. The police came and took her away for an interrogation and they gave her like a sentence saying that, uh, or they gave her like a prohibition seeing her son for six months and if she violated that prohibition, uh, she would be jailed for six months. So that was. Uh, so you see so many examples on these retaliations going on that it's it's, it's almost ironic to see. So um, and speaking about sentences, if um, I'm, um, we, I talked about the Swedish fin Finnish family who had to flee to Dubai. They were safe there because Dubai has now extradition agreement with Norway, so they're perfectly safe there, and they've been there for many years now. But even though, even five years after they flee, had to flee to Dubai, uh, the Norwegian police is still uh, pressing charges against them. So it proves how how much retali retaliation is going on in these in these cases. And Norway is using uh, European arrest warrants for those uh, mothers and fathers. Yeah. They are doing it, absolutely, and they have been addressing a lot of cases to Poland as well. Um, I've been helping a lot of families who had to flee to Poland. Um, and um, I have to give credit to Poland for in the cases I've been involved in, six or seven of the cases, Poland has uh, given uh, very solid support to these families. And even though Norway has in the f some of these cases, not all of them, but some of them, tried to um, have like an extradition agreement with Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, Poland has refused to do so. So uh, in the cases where I've been involved, Poland has given tremendous support to these families. And that also proves that a lot of Norwegian families uh, have come to Poland because this is probably the country there where, where the protection or the, the basic rights are being uh, protected the most. Yeah, so but I think that, and this is interesting as well, since we're talking about the judiciary, because Norway is upset with Poland, since Poland yeah. has... This might be the next question, the next yeah. question. So recently, only a week ago, a Norwegian judge said that he didn't want to extradite a Polish citizen to Poland because as a revenge for Norway doing so the other way. 
saying that he didn't trust the Polish judiciary. So he said that we have no confidence in the Polish judiciary, so we're not going to extradite this Polish citizen to Poland. So, so you see, it's like a repayment, yeah, it's a repayment sort of like um, they um, and 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 you know the. The, the media in Norway, and that also upsets me, the media, and the, without any knowledge about the Polish system, they try to mock the Polish system, saying that Poland doesn't have independent judges, blah, 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 they don't have an efficient judiciary, and so So, on. so, so we have a situation that Poland uh, uh, doesn't allow Norway to take uh, uh, women that took uh, her, their own child to, to other country, mm -hmm. and from the other side we have Norway that says we're not gonna uh, give back your um, uh, criminals like uh, drug with drugs yeah. and uh, criminals. I think that was with a drug case. Yeah. Uh, this, exactly. is the, this, is the, this was a drug case, and before it was a case of uh, uh, money laundering and yeah. and and uh, some. Uh, so when Poland is actually protecting families who are fleeing from Norway, uh, Norway is retaliating by saying that we will not return your drug dealers or your money laundering dealers or whatever. So it's. Um, it's ironic to see, and it's very provocative for me to see that how Norway is especially mocking three countries. I don't know why, but it's, it's Poland, it's Turkey, and it's Russia. It's like they have, like they say that these countries have like banana republic uh, judiciary systems and so on. And even the Norwegian Judge Association have written that in their book, saying that, for instance, like Russian judges don't even really, don't know even where the European Court of Human Rights is. So it's, um, it's very provocative for me as a human rights counselor to travel around to meet people and see how, how a small country, an arrogant country can commit so brutal human rights crimes and try to cover their own crimes by mocking others. Okay, so uh, we, we got also, uh, we have also this um, RAFCO uh, foundation. Uh, RAFCO foundation, yeah. Uh, RAFCO foundation in, in Bergen. In Bergen, yeah. That uh, made like a complaint or a statement to mm -hmm. the European Union, I think, mm -hmm. also to Polish president. Mm -hmm. And they were inviting the Justitia judges. Mm -hmm. uh, so the judges they are in contrary to the Polish government uh, about that Polish judiciary is not independent. So, uh, could you say more about it, and, and also in the context of uh, in the interdependence of, of the Norwegian system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 quite fascinating to see how the how the Norwegian uh, Law Association, the Norwegian Judge Association, and the Rafta Foundation, uh, the Norwegian government, and so on. They are they are playing on the same on the same team by by making. Uh, statements against uh, the Polish judiciary that that makes the average reader in Norway thinking that the Polish judiciary must be like uh, worse than in the wor even the worst third world countries. That's that's the impression people get when they read the newspapers because it, they, they say that the judges are totally, the judges are not independent, they're not, uh, they're totally dependent upon the government and so on. So in a way it's um, it's, it's a way to uh, misinform the public intentionally, because this is, has obviously an intentional meaning. Um, at the same time where the Norwegian media is not mentioning with a word about wrong human rights violations. So, you know, even after 11, 12 convictions on this child welfare area since 2018, uh, hopefully more next Thursday, uh, the media is hardly writing anything about it, and if they write about it, they say that there is like these judgments that they don't they don't matter at all because they might have some procedural errors or something. But our system is perfect. So what really tires me after is to see how they how they salute themselves, and and this double standard is like uh, frightening to see. When when from my perspective, I see all these people who are suffering from the system, because I see that every day. And I get like uh, requests and inquiries every day from desperate parents who either want to flee to somewhere, they ask me, Mars, where can I flee? What's the safest place to me, for me to go? Because I have the government after me. So it's really like, it, it, it gives me associations back to the, <coughs> to the persecution times where, where, where the state is sort of like uh, so sovereign that <coughs> individual freedom is lost. And that's why I think uh, you have the benefit from, because you have seen, or Eastern European countries have seen 
how a totalitarian state has, um, in, the, in the past, has been running the societies. And I think that, in a way, Norway has become the, sort of like the new communist system in Norway in, 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 in Europe. The only problem, the thing is that it's, it's a very rich kind of communism. But it's a state where the state is in total control of pretty much everything. And a state where the state actually has the opinion that <coughs> it should interfere with the biological families. And even some politicians are of the opinion that the state should interfere in every family. So not, not necessarily meaning that they should take the child into public care in, the, in every family. But it's obvious that this, this, this point of view is very contrary to most of the rest of Europe. And the European Court uh, directly said that Norway <coughs> violate Article 8.2 because it interfered uh, not proportionally in the democratic society. That's right. This is the one point. It's like co copy paste the uh, from the judgment, and uh, didn't balance the interests of the child and uh, and the families. And the, and the families. Mm -hmm. That's so and the, the politicians and the system <coughs> is saying no, it's is good. This is the right way to do it. The politicians are still in the, um, they, they still claim that this system is uh, one of the best in the world. Or like the general attorney said to the Grand Chamber when we had the proceedings going on in, in September 2019, that he, he stated precisely that Norway has the best child welfare system in the world. That's what he told the judges. Okay. So you see, and, and that, that is really frustrating to see how a, how a modern society can <clears throat> I can I can pick on other countries without any knowledge. I mean, it's not for Norway to to pick on either to other countries when they are committing so gross human rights violations themselves. And, and and the interesting part, if Norway is being convicted next Thursday, that's a, that's that can be a mark that can be a mark day because if that happens, then the number of convictions are so high that this may be, the next level might be the ICC court in Hague, the International Criminal Court. Because if you have, if you have more than 12 convictions in such a short amount of time, uh, that means that there is a systematic violations going on and this is like persecution against minority families. So that's why I think uh, if we have a conviction next Thursday, which I truly hope and, uh, will happen, then I think we, we might be able to address these issues to the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Because then it proves that this is not just deliberate judgments, these are fundamental and structural systematic, viol systematic violations. Structural yes. system. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so my, my and, and, and that's the thing, you know, the, these are the worst violations, or, or even the worst violence you can do to people. I mean, State, it's sort of like state terrorism against uh, ordinary families because all of the families I met in these cases are, are, are quite normal families. I mean, this would never have happened in any other countries. And if they were in other countries, they would never have had any problems with their child welfare. We, we are running a case with a Norwegian citizen <coughs> that is uh, seeking an asylum in, uh, in Poland because Poland gave, I think, uh, two, uh, in 2020, uh, gave two asyl, uh, as, um, uh, as, uh, asyl for Norwegian citizens. One was for, for Siligarno, in the case of... of <coughs> I of think it was 219. Or, or two, yeah, two, 219. 19, sorry, 19. Uh, so, and uh, we are running also a case with a Norwegian that uh, also seeks um, uh, the security from, from Poland. Uh, and uh, <coughs> my question is, what we can do? What, uh, what other countries like uh, that those people are fleeing can do, and what uh, international community like the OSCE can do it? How the European Union can uh, uh, can what can do, or other third parties, countries? Well, well, first of all, the European Parliament has, uh, I think, has done a good job by by uh, making awareness about this. Um, there are several members of the European Parliament that have. Um, raised awareness also in the parliament about the situation. Um, but obviously it's, uh, it's even important to bring more awareness as long as Norway continues to, to violate the, the fundamental rights even after, uh, even after the convictions. Because that proves that Norway <coughs> thinks as long as they pay out a sum of money, it's, uh, they can continue as before. And since violence is the topic of this conference, um, I think it's a tremendous opportunity also to address the fact that 
But this is this is what I call gross state violence. I mean, you are actually ruining families who are perfectly normal, and that proves to this. Um, and I also hope that this AS versus Norway, which um, which is with this Polish woman, can can bring some even more awareness in Poland that the fact that the Norwegian government, even after the conviction, is actually ruining in her life. Uh, she's desperate. She hasn't seen her son for many, many years, not even a single hour. Uh, and that continues even after the, um, the delivery of the judgment. So, um, so obviously this, um, this must be brought to a higher level, in my opinion, where also Poland is taking a stronger stand against Norway. So, so, co uh, so it should be uh, Norway should be brought uh, up uh, to the community of ministers of the Council of uh, Europe. <coughs> they are already brought up there, <coughs> and and and, Nor and the minister is aware of the fact because they have not closed the cases. Norway has tried for years to close the cases, saying that we have paid the money, we are so good, blah blah blah, you know, and they. Says, please close the case because we have complied with the judgments. What that's what they say, but the ministry of uh, the committee of ministry have not closed the cases, so that proves that the cases are still pending in the system. But as long as you don't have any sort of like um, uh, sanction system against the country, it's uh, it's difficult, and that's why I've said that even that um, it's important in, uh, for the international society to put some sanctions on the system. So the European Union should uh, <coughs> try to make sanctions on Norway or to inform that there it is... Has been, it has been debated before, especially in 2016 when there were some really sensitive issues uh, with regard to, for instance, Czech citizens and uh, citizens from Slovakia. Uh, they had, there were serious discussions about whether they should uh, expel the diplomats from these countries. Um, so obviously this has been an ongoing dialogue for a long time, um, but I still, I'm still missing the fact that it's possible for the international society to put even more pressure on our Okay, and uh, you, 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 United Nations, uh, because um, it's like an international, also it's a global kind of uh, case. Uh, uh, Norway not only violate those uh, parents' rights but also child rights. Yeah, basically, mm -hmm. the the judgments are also saying this. Yeah, so of course they are. As long as they're violating Article Eight, they're violating the children's rights, the which was stated in the in the Lubin case that mm -hmm. the children. The convention child, of, of child rights. So yeah. the UN convention is mentioned, and uh, the problem is that I think that. When it comes to the UN, uh, for some reason Norway has uh, put a lot of money into this system, so they, I don't think they even, they're not even aware of these, uh, these problems in the UN for some reasons. They are aware of it in the, in the European Parliament, the Euro European Court of Human Rights, in the Council of Europe. When, when you're talking about UN, I think they, they see Norway is like, uh, Norway was even given the, um, the seat in the Security Council last year. So that proves that they have a high standing in the UN. Okay. Uh, so I think we can, because we are finishing uh, our hour of, of seminar, but uh, maybe our guests can have some uh, question uh, to, the, to, our, uh, to our guest, Marius. Do you have any questions? Yeah, um, it was very interesting to listen to uh, all things, also from the perspective of my work as uh, being a diplomat uh, and covering the Nor Norwegian <coughs> region and I had uh, faced uh, a case also as a consul uh, in my uh, past where uh, a, uh, it was in Sweden, not in Norway, where a child, well, where I got a, a call from a Slovenian citizen's family, and they said our child was taken away uh, because our child said that he was beaten. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it is, uh, uh, according to Swedish law, uh, forbidden, forbidden to, mm -hmm. to, uh, yeah, to a child, of course. Uh, and of course, I had uh, the duty to protect the Slovenian citizens. Uh, I mean, luckily, everything turned out after uh, well after two weeks. But I mean, for these two, uh, two weeks, the the, uh, the members of these families were forbidden to get in touch with the child, uh, and they said uh, we need now the first judgment, what the, mm -hmm. they will say, and how is this, and so on. So 
so uh, as I said, lucky everything turned for turn, but uh, yeah, it was as you said uh, on the this social security center at that moment to protect the child, to lock all the doors, to to so I, I to realize that India with a population of 1.4, 1.5 billion people have paid so much attention to this case and this case can be potentially seen worldwide by uh, by this me by this movie so so there that's but but smaller countries like Lithuania Czech Republic Slovakia and so on have also tried to do the same to to make the same measures saying that these are our citizens and you should return them to us by uh, without any pro prospect of success so it depends it depends on the state. It depends on the state, yeah. Okay, uh, do you have any more questions, maybe, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs? No, thank you very much. No? Thank you for this presentation, I know. Okay, do you have any uh, questions, maybe, yeah, Madame? No, uh, no, I really have questions. Stay out there. Thank you for the, for the presentation. Um, I guess there's also a, of course, uh, the, the, the balancing here in terms of how uh, the best interest of the child, I mean, that's really what it comes down to, right? The interpretation as to what the Norwegian state uh, has as their interpretation of what is considered the best interest of the child uh, versus what, uh, what a lot of these cases are always, uh, or are clearly showing that there is room for both improvement and... Uh, well, what these cases obviously prove is that the, the paramount picture of the best interest of the child has been not been interpreted correctly by, by the Norwegian government. That's, that's what these cases so if you, I mean, the, it's stated in all of these judgments that the paramount picture of the of these judgments are the best interest of the child. Everyone agrees on that, uh, so that's not a disagreement. But but uh, they, these judgments definitely prove that Norway has not delivered the expectations when it comes to these standards. So that's uh, because, as he as you said, there's uh, when you take into consideration the uh, the concept of the best interest of the child, you also have to um, include the family life. You cannot only include what's what the government thinks is the best for the child. You have to include the family life as well. So uh, and each state has inter if they sign a convention, they have like the obligation from the convention and the court, European Court of Human Rights. Besides, what is the, what is the definition? Mm -hmm. And also, the you know, in the beginning, Nor <coughs> Norway said that this is an Eastern European phenomena that only the Eastern European countries disagree with us because they have a different blah blah blah. But you saw in the Grand Chamber judgment that actually most of the countries who convicted uh, the judges came from um, countries f from Western European countries or South European countries. So this is more like uh, it's obvious that. Uh, our interpretation of that concept failed, or has failed. And, and keep in mind that still another 20, 22 cases are pending before the court. So theoretically, within two years, or we can have like 30 convictions. That's, um, that's sensational numbers when you think of Norway's 5.3 million people, where the Council of Europe consists of 830 million people. So, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you all for gathering. So, so in the morning. So, thank you all. Thank you. If you, okay, thank you. Have a good conference. Thank you. Bye. Okay.